Assalamu alaikum and welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, so I'm Dr. Amjit Khan, uh, consultant pediatric dermatologist at Shifa International Hospital, Islamabad. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, pediatric dermatology in ER today. This is uh, because this is the first of the series. So I would like to take the time to just introduce uh, that we are uh, running a purpose run pediatric dermatology service. Uh, recently started uh, in uh, Islamabad at Shifa International, and I am the Pakistan's first UK trained uh, pediatric dermatologist or child skin specialist. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, a webinar series of six lectures uh, or presentations uh, more aimed towards uh, ER pediatric dermatology. Uh, my colleagues uh, on frontline. Uh, either in pediatric ER, pediatric on-call, or uh, general casualty or uh, emergency room, uh, any presentation in pediatric dermatology will try to cover most of them. Uh, and you will see, usually if you talk to people, they will say pediatric dermatology is a small specialty, but when we talk about the topics, the presentations, and the subjects, after six webinar series, you will realize uh, how many period, uh, how many of us have seen period dermatology cases, how much workload is involved. And uh, although it is subtle uh, on presentation, but uh, if we pick it up, it will help our uh, young patients and their families. Uh, just to start with the uh, disclaimer, uh, we have no financial interest uh, and nothing to declare. And this is a pure CME or educational event. Now, pediatric dermatology in emergency room or ER. So the first topic we have uh, picked up is infection. Uh, in our uh, region, in our country, uh, in our climate, uh, infections are a reasonably big chunk of our workload. And it's a huge topic. I'm sure you would, uh, you would all agree. So I've picked up uh, the common presentations, the problematic ones, and then there are some uh, interesting cases as well. So you can see uh, generally uh, in skin infections or any infections, we usually uh, divide them in bacterial, fungal, and viral, and then other mixed. Uh, viral infections, we will have a separate uh, lecture predominantly for herpes simplex and zoster. Uh, and as well as allergic irritational conditions, we'll have separate uh, presentation because that's part of another spectrum as well. So today we will be covering bacterial, uh, fungal, uh, as well as uh, sort of nappy rash, viral exam themes and special cases. Let's start with the bacterial infection and the first and the most common we will see is impetigo. Uh, I'm sure most of us would have seen impetigo, which is honeycomb crusting uh, spreading very rapidly, mostly head and neck. And uh, there are two major different types. One is the contagiosa one and the other one is bullous. And uh, mostly the underlying etiology is group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. Uh, but coagulase positive Staph aureus is also uh, involved in the etiology. Now you can see uh, the difference between the previous photographs and this one. Uh, this is the bullous impetigo. Now the difference or the clue points for clinical uh, diagnosis is uh, obviously uh, you can see uh, on both the photographs have uh, scaly honeycomb crusted lesions, uh, some satellite lesions, and the blister itself is very uh, thin walled, uh, flaccid, superficial. And most of the time, by the time we see the patients, uh, it is ruptured because it's ruptured easily because of thin wall. And hence we have uh, erosion rather than the bull, uh, bullous uh, presentation. It is very contagious, hence uh, very common in nurseries, schools, uh, young classes. If one gets it, uh, other kids will start getting it. We do suggest uh, using uh, standard precautions, separate towels, uh, washing hands as part of the COVID pandemic, we'll be doing that anyway. Uh, and uh, not to touch our face and mouth because that's where it 
starts and then spreads through the parts of the body. Now, bearing in mind, uh, it is more common in anyone with pre-existing skin disease, so eczema, psoriasis, uh, any other inflammatory dermatosis, unfortunately, can result in it. Also, when we go into our next lecture, I think it's third or fourth, where we'll be talking about uh, skin emergencies. Uh, it is uh, regarding the herpes virus. So this can pre-exist or this can complicate the already existing skin infection. So if somebody has a herpes infection, eczema herpeticum, um, impetigo can coexist and complicate the treatment. Now let's talk about the treatment for impetigo. Not every uh, child needs oral antibiotics. Please do consider if it is localized very early on, uh, solitary or uh, sort of few lesions with no systemic signs. Child is otherwise well. It's not around the eyes, not around the critical areas. Uh, then you can use topical agents, including fusidic acid, which is available here in Pakistan. Obviously, uh, it also depends on the local availability, availability of the products because unfortunately here in Pakistan, we don't have oral fluoxacillin, which is the gold standard in most of the parts uh, across the globe. But we do have uh, other options like erythromycin, topical bactroban, uh, and antiseptic options. Now let's talk about the other option, which is uh, where other condition, which is folliculitis. So here uh, the photograph depicts uh, healthy hair follicle, and you can see the infected hair follicle. So now the hair follicle can get infected because of very many reasons. Uh, some of them are iatrogenic or induced. Like if we prescribe someone an ointment, let's say if somebody has got eczema, and they put the ointment on the skin and move against the hair follicle. So let's say if my hair, this is my hand, we advise to put the ointment and then use it only one side, which is the in line of the hair follicles. But if somebody puts it on and then rubs it on left and right or up and down, we can push the ointments into the hair follicle openings, mostly seen in hot, humid environments. And then what will happen? We will block the pore and the infection will start. So that's one reason of uh, folliculitis. Other reasons, uh, mostly in uh, men, but can happen in both uh, sexes equally. When we are having uh, to shave our uh, hairs, uh, whether on the face or other parts of the body, if we go in line of the, uh, of the hairs, again, the same uh, etiology, uh, it's fine if we go against it or reverse shaving, that can induce a specific condition called as folliculitis barbi. It's a superficial uh, infection and it can go deeper. Now in uh, cold countries, uh, in most of the places where we have uh, uh, standardized bathtubs across uh, you know, the cultures, uh, then hot tub uh, bathing can cause uh, infection as well. Uh, and again, because of some ingredients, uh, once we put it on, sometimes chlorine irritation. So a few things which can, uh, which we have to keep an eye uh, out for. Usually it's a staph infection. And uh, the treatment, again, it's good hygiene, but usually topical antibiotics. Not every patient of skin infection needs to be treated with oral antibiotics. I'm repeating myself again and again, and you will see it will happen a few times uh, during the course of these webinars, because the practices here are slightly over the top. Uh, we use antibiotics left, right, and center. Uh, as a society, as a profession, we have to be more uh, logical. We have to be more responsible for what we are prescribing. So it's a request to all my uh, colleagues and uh, juniors that please do uh, prescribe sensibly when you are uh, giving prescriptions out to the patients, especially about antibiotics. Because antibiotic resistance is, uh, is a significant issue and we will have to face it 
in our near future uh, and bearing in mind uh, it's a sitting time bomb we are sitting on uh, across the globe we are seeing resistant strains for very many different things so please be sensible and uh, uh, have a proper approach to the prescriptions now if the folliculitis if the uh, hair follicle infection continues and goes deeper so dermis uh, and subcutaneous tissue it can become frontal now this obviously needs uh, oral antibiotics sometimes if it is a significant sized one uh, it can need uh, incision and drainage uh, again it's a staph infection and uh, it's a very tender nodule so once it starts becoming bigger size is bigger more than one centimeter it's tender it's deeper fluctuating like with the uh, abscess formation then we have to think about boil or frontal if it continues further uh, usually it doesn't but let's say if it does then we have to one keep an uh, open mind and think about is the person immuno suppressed immuno compromised on steroids has got diabetes or any other systemic illness which is reducing the uh, body's own protection systems and immunity uh, but again with regards to carbuncle uh, you can see it is uh, they can be multiple uh, very deep and they are large abscesses these usually present with systemic signs so if somebody develops fevers chills uh, then definitely we have to uh, think about carbuncle we cannot just label it as a folliculitis uh, and uh, we have to think about draining the abscess and then giving appropriate antibiotic cover coming to fungal infections uh, obviously these are the basic ones which most of us will come across in er uh, some of you might say we haven't covered most of the other bacterial infections do think about uh, the topic we are considering er presentations only which uh, uh, the first line uh, or front line staff uh, come across now tinea capitis so fungal infection is with regards to the body part involved so capitis is the head crurus pedis ungum and corporis so different parts of the body most of them are annular scaling erythematous lesions so red lesions scaling lesions and annular or discoid disc shaped lesions treatment depends on uh, the presentation systemic science topic or oral but we'll uh, go through each of them separately let's talk about a case an 8 year old boy demonstrated an annular scaly plaque on the neck extending into the scalp with broken hairs and the last is very important uh, i should have made a marked it in red it's a prominent right occipital lymph node so what does this signifies uh, so anything which is more than skin deep will involve our other organs, other systems. So this has gone into the lymphatic system and lymph node is enlarged, which means it is not only skin, it is beyond skin. So this is whatever type of infection it is, it is significant. Now, what is the rash? What causes it and how do we treat it? So this is tinea capitis. This is a fungal infection of the skull, discoid, scaly, annular, raised, and you can see the lymph node very prominent. Now, anything which involves our lymphatic system or skin deep, anything which is beyond skin will need systemic agents. So if it was only localized to the skull, only the top layer, early presentation, no systemic involvement, and non-tender. Now, then we usually use topical agents. There is another worse variety of this. So one is mild variety, which I've just mentioned about the topical, moderate is this one. And the severe end is carry-on formation. So tinea capitis at the worst end of the spectrum is called as carry-on formation. It's oozy, painful, it's significantly painful, and multiple lymph nodes. And it's not responding to any treatment. You will definitely need oral anti-fungal treatment for that. So for mild, it's topical. For moderate and severe, uh, you will need oral, ant uh, oral antifungals. And you can see tinea So this is the mild variety. You cannot, there is no involvement of the scalp uh, lymph nodes. Obviously, again, bearing in mind, while in ER, looking at the skin, uh, 
uh, we have to examine the child. We have to look at the lymph nodes. And please document that. Those of uh, my colleagues who, will, who are considering overseas uh, training or practice anywhere outside Pakistan, uh, documentation, even in Pakistan, documentation is very important. Uh, do uh, start doing practice even while here, uh, that is gold standard. So that uh, wherever you go, you have uh, good habits and uh, you are adjustable to the system. If you are overperforming, that's fine. You, nobody will say why you are doing that. But if you are underperforming, then people will uh, sort of do uh, talk about your point fingers towards you. So documentation, documentation, documentation is very important. So obviously you have examined the child, you, you will say no lymph nodes, no regional lymph nodes, no oozing, non-tender, topical, uh, superficial, discoid, scaly uh, lesion, which is annular and uh, with some hair loss on the scalp, obviously, whichever part it is, then you can justify saying I've given topical agent. And while you have written these two lines, nobody will turn around and say why you have given a systemic agent. Now this is carry on formation. You can see broken down skin, uh, fissure, fissuring in the skin. This was very painful. Now, unfortunately, uh, for reasons uh, not known to me, uh, carry on tinea capitis or scalp fungal infection was very, very common uh, in Asian and Afro-Caribbean population when I was practicing in London, uh, while Caucasian population had less involvement. Possibly are, uh, what my understanding is possibly because of the uh, barbers we use because their, their instruments are not clean enough or um, if somebody gets one, we sometimes share our uh, combs and brushes. So again, personal hygiene have separate brushes and combs. Uh, if you see any scaling, uh, we are while in Pakistan, we say it's dandruff only. Even if it's a fungal infection, we say khushki ho gaya, dandruff ho gaya. Uh, it's not always dandruff. It can be it can be fungal infection. Actually, most of the time it is. Now, what is the treatment? Let's talk about the treatment options for tinea capitis or carry on. So topically, you can use uh, meconazole. You can use uh, any uh, antifungal agent, but orally in a child, what will you use? So grisofulvin has been the gold standard throughout our previous sort of last 10, 20 years. Terbinafin is the second one, which is again, sometimes off license because according to the age of the child, but it is much more safer. Uh, we do uh, suggest doing uh, LFTs, uh, liver function test before starting uh, antifungal in a young child because for carry-on you will have to give six to eight weeks. And then just before stopping the treatment, another liver function test to see if you have, uh, if iatrogenically we have in, in, induced any uh, LFT abnormality. Yeah. Most of them, they are transient. If you pick up something, we'll have to repeat the LFTs again in six weeks time after stopping the treatment to see if it has normalized. But again, this is a precautionary exercise and safety. Safety is paramount for our patients. Now let's talk about the second case, uh, a 10 year old boy developed an expanding annular uh, sort of plague on the interior neck. And you can see potassium hydroxide preparation uh, showed branching hyphae. Some people will do it. Some people will do the scraping, send it to the laboratory and they will do it for you. So you can do it in ER or if you're uh, proficient enough or competent enough, you've already done it before, or you can just send it to the laboratory and they will help you out. What is the rash? What causes it? And how do you treat it? Again, we are talking about fungal skin infections. And you can see this is tinea corporis or a, a involving of the body. And uh, all the fungal infections, they are red, scaly, annular. Uh, and uh, you can see it's more on the face, trunk, or limbs can be itchy. So if it's itchy, don't get confused with... Uh, eczema. If it is a circular, discoid, scaly, even if it is itchy, do take a skin scraping for fungal infection uh, and treat accordingly. They are well demarcated, sometimes can have pustular border, so we can, it can confuse ourselves having, uh, considering the bacterial infection. But bearing in mind, please do consider uh, infections can, multiple infections can coexist. Just like we talked about eczema, herpetic, menempetigo, so tinea corporis or any tinea infection can have secondary bacterial infection. 
aid reaction or auto eczematization uh, this is a different thing uh, so it's a generalized reaction away from the primary lesion so don't get confused again for the, with the eczema and the treatment is terbinafine uh, usually again some other photographs for tinea corporis uh, and you can see discoid active lesion uh, active borders and sometimes can have central clearing as well now the point i wanted to make here was regarding topical antifungals meconazole and ketoconazole are superior nystatin sometimes people use it it is not effective against ringworm infection predominantly or mostly uh, so better use the highly efficacious products which are available uh, rather than just hanging on to nystatin so a 16 year old this is the next case let's talk about it a 16 year old soccer player complained of intense itching and burning in the groin for one week he attributed the rash to playing matches in the rain for the preceding two weeks now again thinking on just on the on, on these lines uh, young person groin burning intense itching playing matches in the rain so it will be moist environment wet environment and again uh, you can think about uh, fungal infection uh, where obviously these things uh, do start you can see uh, it's a racially pigmented skin but hyperpigmentation is very common uh, very obvious and uh, again uh, it's very well demarcated in the groin line at stenia cruris and you can see erythematous hyperpigmented uh, scaly plaques and you can uh, can see they are slightly on the inguinal creases and extending down the medial thigh so you know bearing in mind especially in hot humid environment sometimes wet environment this can happen now this these are other presentations so you can see some uh, pustular element on the upper photograph so do think about uh, bacterial infection the lower one is the standard one obviously ages are different and they are also called as uh, jock itch so if you are reading a book and uh, they are slightly historic uh, previously they used to be called as jock itch so please do consider uh, you know you can interchange these terminologies and treatment again if no systemic signs topical antifungal is the treatment now let's talk about the next case which is a 20 year old again we are talking about pediatric dermatology 16 17 18 is usually the cut off uh, if a person is already known to uh, the pediatrician we can go up to 20 years of age and that's this practice i've seen um, happening in uh, uk uh, so again this is slightly outside our our uh, sort of bracket uh, but 18 20 year olds having an extensive itchy rash involving the soles and under surfaces of the toes and web spaces this was obviously an athlete uh, uh, a very good sort of uh, uh, professional who was uh, aspiring to 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 become uh, a professional athlete so this is tinea pedis also known as athlete's foot why because of the moist uh, sweaty feet uh, and because they do train for longer hours so the the, the foot uh, uh, coverings or or the footwear has to be wear for longer so that's the reason the historic name athlete's foot came from and uh, you can see uh, it's a fungal infection sometimes with erosion vesicles are less common again because of the rub constant rub and uh, you can do the scrapings they are obviously gold standard to do scrapings before starting the treatment and then topical antifungal creams preferably meconazole now the other two three precautions keep the feet dry cotton socks uh, if possible open shoes um, and again with regards to uh, sort of the limitation of the friction so if you are wearing a shoe better be that one which is of less friction um, and then um, if somebody has got excessive sweating uh, we have to consider sweating treatment as well and uh, another few photographs different presentations and you can see now what is the differential here another thing look at the number one photograph that's the reason i put it on there uh, if uh, some of you follow me on on facebook i've started a educational activity and educational challenge uh, where we do weekly uh, challenging cases or common cases and then talk about the differential and treatment so if you look at number one photograph 
uh, this can easily be confused with juvenile plantar dermatosis. And if you look at the last photograph, number four on, on the screen, this can be easily confused with psoriasis. So hence, we have to sort of keep an open, eye, uh, open mind, talk about uh, the differentials, speak to the patient, have a proper history, and then uh, initiate the treatment um, before, uh, after doing the investigation like skin scrapings. Tinea versicular, again, this is a fungal infection. Actually, I've seen just yesterday, treated by uh, one of my dermatology colleagues in community, was not getting better. Um, this is a fungal infection uh, with the presentation is usually on the upper back, can be neck involvement, and sometimes face. Face is usually late. And uh, this is, uh, again, a fungal infection where the skin pigmented so pigmentary cells or uh, melanocytes are involved and uh, mostly prominent in summer. Why? Now, the pathophysiology is an infected skin doesn't tan much. Normal skin does. So what happens if it's summer, especially here in Pakistan, you go out in the, in the bright sunlight uh, and most of the kids do. They will go out and play regardless of the temperatures outside. Uh, and you will realize that normal skin will tan. So if you go back, Normal skin will tan, infected skin hasn't tanned. So it will look lighter and the families will get wor worried about it. The other worry is recurrence. It is very common. Uh, and that's what happened with the child yesterday I've seen. Uh, and the, now what is what are the treatment options? Antifungal shampoos, usually ketoconazole shampoo on the body. And selenium sulfide. So selsun blue is very widely available. It comes, it's a selenium sulfide shampoo, again, on the body. I usually tell them to leave it for a few minutes, up to five to 10 minutes on the body before washing it off because it's a treatment we are doing. Now, toenail uh, infection, a fungal infection of the toenail or necromycosis. Uh, and uh, you can see quite uh, destructive nails, yellowish, thick, uh, distal onycholysis. Uh, and what are the treatment options? Again, Unfortunately, because nails are themselves, uh, if you put something on the nail, it doesn't do much. We have to put it on the place where the nail factory is or where, where the nail is being made. So if I put my uh, cursor here, you can see this is the area where, yes, the treatment needs to be on the nail because it can get absorbed under the nail around the sides, but it also needs to be on the place where the nail is being formed. Uh, and then you will start seeing improvement. We usually suggest, uh, initially, if it is very early on, very uh, one or two nails involved, mild, uh, you can use uh, emerald, emerald and nail lacquer. Uh, it was not available in Pakistan up until recently, but I've just recently noticed one of the companies have started marketing uh, because we don't have any financial association. And uh, this is a CME educational activity. I would not like to mention the name of the company or the product, but it's available in the market. You can explore it yourself. Uh, but the oral uh, terbinafin you can use, you can use the traconazole if need to be. Uh, and again, uh, another uh, sort of another hack or another uh, alternative option, alternative treatment, which works is actually Vaporub. So Vicks Vaporub, which is used for the chest, uh, mostly we say, uh, but again, because it has a camphor and eucalyptus, eucalyptus oil, it helps with uh, toenail fungus. So again, we have to think outside the box as a clinician. We have to see what other options are available for improvement. And especially if we are talking about kids, giving them oral antifungals, uh, if it's not needed, uh, you know, we can treat a child with topical agent. Now let's go to the next case. <clears throat> An otherwise healthy six-year-old boy presents for evolution. Now the fungal infections have stopped this, the next section, which is the viral infection. And this is for uh, you know, a young child with multiple lesions, uh, which are asymptomatic. And he has developed it over the last few months. Now, I will add on here, this child went to, it's a very regular swimming pool uh, sort of person, always likes to be around the water. Uh, so you can see these are pearly papular lesions with sometimes central umbilication and sometimes can have yellowish material inside them. It's not pus, it's actively replicating virus and it's highly contagious, hence the name contagiosum. And uh, so these are obviously the photographs. Um, um, I have to, um, I will have a disclaimer at the end. Photographs are stock images from Google images because of the consent and other things. 
and uh, uh, dominant anxiety. Now, molluscum contagiosum, it's a viral infection. You can see central umbilication, uh, umbilication here. They spread very easily, unfortunately. And uh, sometimes they can be itchy, mostly they are not. So what we have to tell families, please uh, if, and educate the child, please try not to itch them. If you scratch them, wash your hands. Otherwise the yellowish material, which is not the pus active replicating virus, you can spread it to other parts of the body. It's more of a worry when it goes to the face. Treatment options. Unfortunately, we don't have very many products available here. Uh, uh, the main idea is uh, destruction. So chemical, thermal, uh, you know, destruction of the lesion, uh, we have to burn them. So either it, we can use silver nitrate, which is painful, unfortunately, curettage, which is painful in a young child, cautery, but the other thing is cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen. All these uh, treatment options are destructive, can leave scarring, not always, but can leave scarring. And the problem is uh, in ER, it's difficult to source curettage and cartridge. I don't know how many ERs will have that. Uh, but silver nitrate is widely available. But please be careful with the use of silver nitrate. I've recently seen a child with silver nitrate burn. Uh, unfortunately, it was uh, done on one part of the body, but it's, uh, you know, it was done uh, in sort of a way where uh, it was not very strictly limited. It went onto the other skin and literally burned the child. It was a uh, four to five centimeter burn. So that's one of the options. But other options are topical agents. So potassium hydroxide, uh, sodium hydroxide. Uh, these are available uh, at least uh, overseas. If my uh, people who have joined us today uh, some of them might be from overseas, then you can use them. them. Uh, the name is molydab, molutrax. Sodium ones uh, are called as cristocide. So uh, a nine-year-old uh, healthy boy developed persistent warts on his hand that spread to his upper lip. So warts, verrucas are the same thing, same viruses. And uh, you can see uh, they are usually small, one to three millimeter. They are benign condition, uh, self-resolving, a human papilloma virus. If it's on the feet, we say verrucas, uh, plantaris or verruca vulgaris on the rest of the uh, sort of feet area or viral warts on the other parts of the body. Uh, most of them will dissolve. But obviously, we need treatment options because if the patient comes to your ER, to your uh, outpatient clinic, uh, or presents to, um, to first-line staff, uh, first-line doctors, then you need to treat them. Again, the treatment is cryotherapy. You can do uh, curettage and uh, cautery. Uh, so again, destruction of epithelial or ep epidermal cell. Now, the good thing is we have other treatment options available uh, here in Pakistan. Salicylic acid-based ointments. So they come uh, commercially available 16, 17%. Only one company makes it uh, from overseas. Uh, but then there are local products available as well. Some pharmacies do compounding, so you can go up to 20, 25, 30%. And in London, I used to use for maximum uh, concentration for very difficult resistant cases, up to 50%. So these are the sort of uh, treatment options available. You can see viral warts. This one obviously will need stronger strength. It's very uh, sort of thickened. Now let's go to the next case. A three-year-old girl develops an is now again for now the viral infections we have dealt with. Other viral infections will be in other uh, lectures, other presentations. We are talking about now the nappy rashes, different type of nappy rashes presenting to ER. So this is a three-month-old girl developed an asymptomatic scaly red eruption in the diaper area, and the face. So face and the diaper area. So our differentials will be starting coming to our mind. The lesions in the diaper area were well circumscribed and red orange in color. So red orange in color, face and groin area and young child, asymptomatic. So all these are you know, uh, important points for us to think about. And so this is seborrheic dermatitis. And if you see uh, very clear cradle cap, uh, but it's actually seborrheic dermatitis. It's uh, usually self-limiting if it is a uh, little amount, it's localized patch, uh, but uh, unfortunately, sometimes it can be widespread. Uh, mostly in the first year of life, can happen later as well. 
uh, the literate presents like so teenagers, late teenagers, young adults, we have to think about again immunodeficiency, diabetes, any other options, systemic diseases. Once rule that out, then obviously just treat them, but uh, think about other options as well, other conditions, and do uh, sort of either investigate or ask questions about. And uh, what are the treatment options? Anti seborrhea shampoo. So Quite a few um, products are available in the market. Topical steroids we use if, if they are symptomatic, itchy, uh, erythematous. Uh, so if they are symptomatic, we use topical steroids. Otherwise, please don't use steroids on seborrheic dermatitis. anti shampoos are available. anti creams are available. And uh, so there are different products and uh, do use them wisely. Again, behind the ears, another place to look out for is mid sternum in uh, young uh, ladies under the breast area because it's uh, another area where seborrheic dermatitis can happen. This is the uh, nappy area of the same child. We're talking about the case presentation and uh, you can see the erythematous scaly uh, patches. Now, a six-month-old boy presents with a diaper rash consisting of confluent bright red papules and plaques with scattered pustules. So here pustules are added on. So you can see from the previous case and there are some satellite lesions. So these are the sort of two uh, giveaway points. And you can see it's a candida infection, uh, scaly satellite lesions. It's much different presentation, even on the lower end of the tummy. If you see, let me put the cursor there. Uh, you can see here, here. And so lower abdomen, you can see the satellite lesions have gone beyond that area as well. And uh, the other uh, point is even the creases. So if, let me put the cursor on. If you see the creases here, the creases here, they are all involved. This differentiated from irritant contact dermatitis because irritation is uh, irritation spares uh, the uh, sort of uh, uh, curves and the, the areas which are on the folds. Now, uh, you can see uh, this is another uh, sort of worse, worse variety of that, but again, lower abdomen is involved here as well. The treatment, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, antifungal treatment. Uh, here you can use nystatin because candida can affect the oral mucosa or internal mucosa. So you can use candida uh, treatment here, uh, antifungals and nystatin is the treatment option here. Now, another uh, rash, another nappy area, uh, a mother describes to you a diaper rash that cleared rapidly with frequent application of a barrier paste. So nothing else, barrier. So zinc oxide, there are so many other products based on zinc oxide in the market. Commercial different names are available. And then they leave it open, nappy area open so that the air drying hap happens, aeration happens. And uh, she wanted to know why this is an issue. And what I've just described earlier, here you can see the flexural areas, the folds are uh, nearly clear. They are not involved. And this is obviously not a fungal infection. This is irritant contact dermatitis, diaper dermatitis, ammoniacal dermatitis is another type if the, because of the urine ammonia, uh, if it has happened. So uh, frequent nappy changes, leave it open, uh, barrier cream so that the skin, even if the child has a dirty nappy, the skin is a bit protected. And you can see it's only on the con convex surfaces and uh, harsh soaps, detergents, uh, avoid harsh soaps and detergents, but use topical medication, barrier cream. Sometimes we do use uh, steroids uh, if, if they are much more symptomatic and not, not getting better. Now, a two month old uh, healthy boy developed a pustular eruption in the diaper area here. It was a pustule. They did the gram stain and showed neutrophils and gram positive cocci. So this obviously confirms this is a bacterial infection. Mostly uh, staphylococcal pustulosis. Uh, if no symptom, uh, symptom, if not symptomatic, no systemic signs, please use topical agents, topical antiseptic, antibiotics. Uh, again, uh, so that uh, you can keep it, get it under control. Yes, if it is spreading despite that. If the child has systemic uh, signs, uh, fever, other problems, please do consider oral. Uh, let's quickly go through the viral exanthemes and then we have some special cases. So I will slightly speed on now. 
so viral exanthemes were given names in the order they were discovered. So first disease, second disease, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. But it was historic. Then people realized uh, that they are not all viral Ill illnesses. Second and third, so scarlet fever and the Duke's disease, it's more of a bacterial infection rather than viral illnesses. But as the knowledge of medicine uh, got improved over time, then obviously we stopped using the order of their discovery. We started giving them names like measles, scarlet fever, rubella, and things like that. And then found out their causative agents and then uh, realized not all of them are viral. So let's talk about measles. Uh, unwell child, we usually say cuff, coryza, conjunctivitis, and complex spot. So this was obviously uh, the uh, mnemonic we used to learn at medical school. Uh, so complication, it, unfortunately, it, it can give you a lot of complications, otitis media, pneumonia, hepatitis, so many things, myocarditis and myelitis at the severe end of the spectrum. And uh, that's usually, uh, the good thing is there is vaccination for measles, uh, so hence, we are seeing less and less of, a, uh, of an issue. But please do encourage your patients and the, uh, the families you see uh, to take the vaccination on. Now, if you look at the, the, the photograph, this child is quite miserable. Uh, coryza, you can see, runny nose, conjunctivitis, you can see slightly red injected. And complex spot has been demonstrated. Uh, so just, you know, think uh, about measles and these conditions. Do uh, We are going through an epidemic. Measles can unfortunately become an epidemic. Pre-vaccination, it used to be a significant issue. Even now, an unvaccinated population, uh, like schools in some areas, will become uh, sort of uh, quite widely, uh, the kids will be uh, involved and infected with it. Now, the reason I've put this slide on, because it can give you photophobia. So we obviously worry about meningitis, do all the basic investigations and screens, but do think about measles if the rash is blanching and they, we have cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. Now, post measles exposure, what we need to do, uh, if uh, all the susceptible uh, contacts, they can have immunoglobulin therapy if indicated, like if they are a young child, immunocompromised, pregnant woman, and less than five months old, if the mom never had an immunity because mom wouldn't have transferred it through the uh, placental uh, immunoglobulin transfer. While live vaccines are contraindicated in immunocompromised and measles, unfortunately, is a live vaccine. So pregnancy and immunocompromised status is one of the contraindications. But allergy to eggs and neomycin is one of, another thing to think about when we are in administering this vaccine. Now, scarlet fever, we'll quickly go through that. It's a bacterial infection, pharyngitis mostly. We can have sand pepper rash. Again, school-going children, it's usually in the whole, you know, sort of... Uh, Pockets of, of the infection is in the uh, classes, schools, and things like that. So a lot of kids will uh, present from the same patch, same area, same school. Uh, it takes a few days for the palms and soles to desquamation. It's around the end of the week. So if you are seeing them early, do uh, sort of do not just uh, rule it out by saying that there are there is no desquamation of the palms and soles. Now white strawberry tongue. I'll show a photograph now. Again, all of us know the. Uh, Investigations, throat swab, asotitis, and 10 days of penicillin. So you can see the strawberry tongue, typical strawberry tongue on, uh, on, on the left side of the screen. And this is for scarlet fever. Rubella, again, luckily we are not seeing much because of the vaccination, but lymph node swelling uh, usually presents on the face, maculopapular rash, and then spreads to the body. The, the main worry is complications. So rubella, unfortunately, can give you very easily encephalitis and joint pain. But the other issue is uh, pregnant ladies, if they come across rubella, uh, you know, the child will have rubella syndrome, very highly likely, microcephaly, PG, and cataract. It's a lifelong issue. And so why not to use uh, a vaccination to, to help our patients and their families? Now, another exam theme, and you can see uh, maculopapular rash on the face. So all the family is involved, but the children are, uh, you know, the, the girl on the back photograph, she's laughing. So systemically well children with erythematous rashes, mostly on the, on the cheeks, and uh, it's called as erythema infectiosum. It's also called as a slapped cheek uh, syndrome or slapped cheek rash. Fifth disease, that was the order it was uh, discovered in, and it's preschool and school going children. And uh, some mild prodome, not much, it's mild prodome. And you can see another child with this. 
and uh, now it's a parvovirus infection uh, mostly in preschool and usually resolved within three to seven days so symptomatic treatment nothing much and now this is a different type of sixth disease a roseola infectum uh, infantum and you can see it's a uh, sort of widespread maculopapular rash child is laughing but what happens in this condition can have abrupt spike of temperature so if you see a child with febrile convulsion in ER and they tell uh, the family tells you the story that, uh, you know, uh, the child had very high fever is in the bracket age uh, under two years of age. And uh, you know, while you're noticing them, you're observing them or they've been admitted if they develop a rash uh, after the fever subsides, then you can be pretty sure it's a uh, sixth disease or roseola infantum. It's mainly on trunk, but can involve the face as well. You can see here, and it's a symptomatic treatment, nothing more. Uh, now let's start, talk about a few special cases. Uh, and you can see a 10 year old boy developed asymptomatic relapsing and remitting hyperpigmented facial, obviously patches on the cheeks. Some, initially they were slightly scaly. Very common, I've seen quite a few here. Family are not worried about infection here. Family are more worried about the cosmetic appearance because it's on the face. Again, more in summer, these patients will say, ye hamare chahre pe do saal se tha, teen saal se tha. Uh, but what happens as soon as the garmiya shuru hoti hai, summer comes in, uh, it is more evident. It comes out. It's again because of the same pathophysiology. Uh, the infected skin doesn't tan. And the non-infected or normal skin tans. So hence the contrast of the skin color or the tone is a lot more different. Here you can see, uh, this is Petrus's alba. Uh, it's not vitiligo. So don't get confused. It is Petrus's alba, reasonably common in young children. Uh, initially, when it is scaly, you can use mild steroids, hydrocortisone-based uh, steroids. Uh, but otherwise, for the color change, we usually use calcineurine inhibitors, either tetrolimus or pimecrolimus. Only tetrolimus is available in Pakistan predominantly. Uh, so you can use 0.03% uh, tetrolimus ointment and uh, once at night for two to three months and it will settle down. Uh, if you are still worried about active infection, if they say, yes, this is sort of spreading, you can use antifungal agent to calm that down uh, as well. Uh, Oxford did a study about these Petrus alba, and uh, they came out with the suggestion that this is Melasesia farfar, a type of a type of fungus, and, and hence uh, justification of antifungal treatment throughout the course. Now, uh, uh, another special case: 17-year-old boy uh, complained of dry, scaly, sand pepper-like papule. Now, again, sand pepper comes to our mind. We think about uh, scarlet fever. Here, the child is systemically well. And it's a long lasting, long history, chronic uh, dry sandpaper like papules on the extensor surfaces. Now, what we usually say for this typical uh, rash cheeks, arms, and then thighs, upper thighs. This is the typical place. It can be other parts of the body, but this is a typical place. Usually, there is a strong family history. Usually, not always. So, here you can see father has had the similar lesions. This is keratotic. Uh, sort of symmetrically distributed erythematous rash, which has keratosis on it as well. You can see the dry scaling at the lower end. And uh, here, another type of, and again, sometimes people do get confused uh, and saying that this is uh, pustular lesions <clears throat> or these are vesicular lesions. So these are not pustular, these are not vesicular. You feel them. They are very hard, uh, sort of stubborn on the skin. Uh, and have some erythematous base as well. And I have chronic uh, longevity. Uh, very rarely will be itchy. Not Usually they are not itchy. This is keratotic plugging called as uh, keratosis pilaris. And uh, the treatment is not steroid at all. The treatment is urea-based moisturizer. So please do, do not give these patients steroids. I've seen at least uh, half a dozen here in the last uh, few weeks of my practice. Uh, the problem is, Everybody thinks it's eczema. They treat it like eczema and it doesn't respond. Uh, very common uh, after viral infections or any other systemic infection, the child gets better, but suddenly develops this. Family gets very worried. It's mostly on uh, dependent parts of the body. And the child is in the first year of life. 
usually under nine months of age and uh, they are sort of quite hemorrhagic uh, and hence the name comes in acute hemorrhagic edema of infancy there is mild edema of hand and feet and uh, usually in the first year but can happen up to the second one as well post viral upper respiratory tract infection sometimes we have given antibiotics um, our primary care colleagues might have treated that but then uh, it comes like this this is non toxic benign condition the child is systemically well afebrile handles well feeding and drink so no other issues as such and it resolves in 1 to 3 weeks of uh, time it's a small some a lot of people have done uh, a lot of uh, uh, case reports are out there this is small vessel uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis but nothing to worry about it's a benign self limiting condition and uh, so don't worry about it and this is mostly seen in the first month of life uh, patchy uh, and uh, erythematous base you can see a small pinpoint papules they can sometime be pus filled sometimes not always and uh, so we it looks like yellowish material if you scrap them look under the microscope so pus is neutrophil but these are eosinophils if it is widespread and you do a blood test eosinophils are high so eosinophils are quite high in this condition whether it's on the skin or in the blood and this is erythema toxicum neonatorum uh, it's a harmless skin condition in neonates uh, and usually Uh, flitting so moves around so one day it's here the other day it just resolves and the other day it comes there two to three weeks and it will settle down uh, if it is itchy symptomatic uh, then do consider uh, moisturizers but not steroids please don't use steroid on this this is a benign condition mostly on the face uh, warm environment very well wrapped child uh, and uh, like and if the weather is like nowadays a very hot this can this can happen uh, we ha- all of us have seen this this is uh, prickly heat sweat rash uh, in young child it can be miliaria rubra which is this red one or crystallina which is slightly whitish spots quite widespread and uh, again no treatment cool the child down a uh, cold sort of tepid warm uh, or sort of lighter cold wa- uh, washes uh, you can wet a cloth and put it on uh, and then moisturizers but no steroids please <clears throat> now this is a neonatal uh, this is a child who was an ex uh, scubu graduate that's what we the, the terminology we like to use has been in special care baby unit was treated there uh, had a stormy uh, initial um, time was discharged let's say you are on er on the front line and this child has been discharged only uh, a week or two or three weeks from your neonatal intensive care or special care and uh, then comes back to your er and family say humne to ghar mein bachche ko nahlaya dhulaya piche uske itna zyada ye dekhe haathon pe aur back pe ye thick uh, fixed asymptomatic pigmentation jab aap feel karte hain it's very firm uh, it's uh, just like calcification under the skin because it is actually this is subcutaneous fat necrosis तो ये मैंने आपको ये सिनेरियो इसलिए बताया है द रीजन आई हैव एक्सप्लेन दिस टू यू बिकॉज़ इन स्पेशल केयर बेबी यूनिट किड्स आर ऑन देयर बैक एंड इफ दे आर हैविंग इन इंट्यूबेशन वेंटिलेशन सेंट्रल लाइंस सो द क्लोरहेक्सिडीन और एनी एंटीसेप्टिक वी यूज वी हैव टू बी बी केयरफुल विद इट बिकॉज़ इफ इट इज इफ यू यूज इट ऑन द ट्रंक और ऑन द फेस और ऑन द नेक वेयर एवर एंड इट ऊजेस बैक और ड्रिप्स बैक टू देयर बैक एंड दे आर लाइंग इन इट इट कैन कॉज दिस सबकंटीन्यूअस फैट नेक्रोसिस and uh, we, if it is widespread like this child we have to check for the calcium because subcutaneous fat necrosis can pull down your calcium uh, on the upper end actually so it can give you hypercalcemia so you have to think about those uh, systemic things but usually it is mild uh, uh, symptomatic treatment mostly we say use mild steroids so that it can uh, and the inflammation can settle down so it's an anti inflammatory response to the steroid that it will calm it down now i've given you the diagnosis uh, it's mostly in teenagers mm, it's uh, treated as a fungal infection that's the problem we think that always these moist areas are fungal infection it's not if you do the woods light it fluoresces and you can see the fluorescence and uh, it's corynebacterium 
treatment is usually antibiotic creams clindamycin it's available clindamycin is used for acne so you can use that in, the, in this area uh, fusidic acid cream is widely available benzoyl peroxide is again a bpo is the uh, acne treatment but you can use it in the axilla and groin for this condition or sometimes if you have compounding available you can do uh, wet field ointment and you have to put put it out and if your pharmacy can make it. And orally, we can usually give oral erythromycin, tetracyclines, uh, if need to be. You use topical agents, it will settle down. Very rarely in resistant cases, and again, not in pediatrics, in uh, grown-ups in uh, old age, diabetes, obesity, poor hygiene, uh, advanced age, this is a recurrent, very problematic, then we can use PDT as well, which is photodynamic therapy. Now this is, uh, I haven't used the patient I've seen. Uh, somebody consulted me, uh, one of my colleagues uh, for his son recently uh, from uh, UK and have this uh, pitted keratolysis. Very common, again, a very enthusiastic athlete. Uh, this is because of excessive sweating, secondary infection. And you can see a lot of different types of bacteria can cause this. And the treatment is topical and then oral. So use topical erythromycin, it's Zinarat in UK, it's available in Pakistan as well. Uh, clindamycin topical, again, acne treatment, but you can use it here, topical agent. Mupiracin, widely available here in Pakistan. Uh, fusidic acid is available, benzoyl peroxide. So these treatment options are available, but this will reduce the infection or make it better. To come, uh, help it not coming back, to avoid it coming back, we need to treat the hyperhidrosis as well. Bearing in mind, let's quickly, uh, 20 seconds, I will talk about hyperhidrosis before conclusion. And the, the hyperhidrosis, we have topical agents, aluminum hydroxide, uh, used to be, uh, overseas, it's called as dry chlor. Uh, it's available here on special uh, prescription, special order uh, from one of the pharmacies in Lahore or pharmaceutical companies in Lahore. Other thing is you can use... Uh, uh, oral medication. So in young patients and young children, uh, we use uh, oxybutynin used for bladder instability in young children. And it's widely written as well. Uh, you can use under monitoring very low dose for hyperhidrosis. You can use pro, uh, propentheline. You can use, so there, there are other systemic agents we can use but for generalized hyperdosis. Other thing is antiphoresis. If it's hands and feet, like in this child, it was only feet, uh, we can do antiphoresis for sweating. Antiphoresis uh, is available in uh, certain departments. You have to check with your, uh, with your local availability, but we do have, uh, we, are, you know, we are planning to start in the next few weeks here. And thank you very much uh, for all uh, of you to attend this today. And, um, uh, we will be this is the first of the series of lectures those who, who have joined a bit late uh, i just wanted to explain this is one of the six lectures this is the first one which is for infection every thursday uh, for next uh, six weeks so next five left now uh, we will be doing these pediatric dermatology and er lectures please do stay in touch with our uh, cme team they will be advertising it as well and again thanks to dermnet nz and stock photographs from google images because of the consent issues i wouldn't I, I was not able to use my own patient's photographs here uh, so uh, if you have any questions we have only a uh, few minutes left i will be happy to answer otherwise uh, we can obviously conclude the lecture. So yes, uh, one of the people have uh, mentioned that can we get recordings? Yes, so our CME team does record all the lectures. It will be available on our uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, it will also be available on my own uh, website, which is dramtikhan.com and on the Facebook uh, where I do the educational activity as well. Somebody wanted to, uh, I think they have twice written down, they wanted to have their skin checked and they wanted some opinion, uh, unfortunately, without looking at your skin. Uh, and obviously this is not the right forum uh, to comment on it. Uh, I will encourage you to do attend our outpatient department and we can guide you through the treatment. So with that, I will probably say thank you very much for all of you and do uh, I will encourage you to join our next um, meeting, next uh, lecture, next Thursday. And please do drop us uh, some feedback. And if you want to see anything different, I will try to modulate my uh, next lectures according to that. So thank you very much and have a lovely day.